Section one of Poems sixteen eighty six by Anne Killigrew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems sixteen eighty six by Anne Killigrew. Section one Alexandreus. I sing the man that never equal knew, whose mighty arms all Asia did subdue, whose conquests through the spacious worlds do ring, that city-raiser, king-destroying king, who o'er the warlike Macedons did reign, and worthily the name of great did gain. This is the prince, if fame you will believe, to ancient story any credit give, who, when the globe of earth he had subdued, with tears the easy victory pursued, because that no more worlds there were to win, no further seen to act his glories in. Ah, that some pitying muse would now inspire my frozen style, with a poetic fire, and raptures worthy of his matchless fame, whose deeds I sing, whose never-fading name, long as the world shall fresh and deathless last, no less to future ages than the past. Great my presumption is, I must confess, but if I thrive, my glory's near the less, nor will it from his conquests derogate, a female pen his acts did celebrate. If thou, O muse, wilt thy assistance give, such as made Nasso and great Maro live, with him whom Melus fertile banks did bear, live though their bodies dust and ashes are, whose laurels were not fresher than their fame, is now and will forever be the same. If thee like favour thou wilt grant to me, O oh, queen of verse, I'll not ungrateful be. My choicest hours to thee I'll dedicate. Tis thou shalt rule, tis thou shalt be my fate. But if coy goddess thou shalt this deny, And from my humble suit disdaining fly, I'll stoop and beg no more, since I know this. Writing of him, I cannot write amiss. His lofty deeds will raise each feeble line, And godlike acts will make my verse divine. T'was at the time the golden sun doth rise, And with his beams enlights the azure skies, When, lo, a troop in silver arms drew near, The glorious sun did near so bright appear. Dire scarlet plumes adorned their haughty crests, And crescent shields did shade their shining breasts. Down from their shoulders hung a panther's hide, A bow and quiver rattled by their side. Their hands a knotty, well-tried spear did bear. Jocund they seemed, and quite devoid of fear. These warlike virgins were, that do reside, near Thermodon's smooth banks and verdant side. The plains of Themiscyri their birth do boast. Thalestris now did head the beauteous host, she emulating that illustrious dame, who to the aid of Troy and Priam came, and her who the Rutulian prince did aid, though dearly both for their assistance paid. But fear she scorned, nor thee like fate did dread. Her host she often to the field had led, As oft in triumph had returned again, Glory she only sought for all her pain. This martial queen had heard how loudly fame Echoed our conqueror's redoubted name. Her soul his conduct and his courage fired, to see the hero she so much admired, 
and to Hyrcania, for this cause she went, where Alexander, wholly then intent, on triumphs and such military sport, at truce with war held both his camp and court. And while before the town she did attend, her messenger's return she saw ascend, a cloud of dust that covered all the sky, and still at every pause there stroke her eye, the interrupted beams of burnished gold, as dust the splendor hid or did unfold, loud neighings of the steeds and trumpets sound, filled all the air and echoed from the ground. The gallant Greeks with a brisk march drew near, and their great chief did at their head appear. And now come up to the Amazonian band, they made a halt and a respectful stand, and both the troops, with like amazement struck, did each on other with deep silence look. The heroic queen, whose high pretense to war, cancelled the bashful laws and nicer bar, of modesty which did her sex restrain, first boldly did advance before her train. And thus she spake, all but a god in name, and that a debt time owes unto thy fame. End of section one. Section two of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Queen As those who pass the Alps do say, The rocks which first oppose their way, And so amazing high do show, By fresh ascents appear but low, And when they come unto the last, They scorn the dwarfish hills they've passed. So, though my muse at her first flight thought she had chose the greatest height, and, imped with Alexander's name, believed there was no further fame, behold an eye wholly divine vouchsafed upon my verse to shine. And from that time I gan to treat with pity him the world called great, to smile at his exalted fate, unequal though gigantic, state. I saw that pitch was not sublime, compared with this which now I climb. His glories sunk and were unseen, when once appeared the heaven-born queen. Victory's laurels conquered kings took place among inferior things. Now surely I shall reach the clouds, for none besides such virtue shrouds. Having scaled this with holy strains, not higher but the heaven remains. No more I'll praise on them bestow, who to ill deeds their glories owe, who build their babbles of renown upon the poor oppressed crown. Whole kingdoms do depopulate to raise a proud and short-lived state. I prize no more such frantic might than his that did with windmills fight. No, give me prowess that with charms, Of grace and goodness, not with harms, Erects a throne with inward parts, And rules men's wills, but with their hearts, Who with piety and virtue thus Propitiates God and conquers us. And that now like Arana here, Altars of praises I could rear, Suiting her worth which might be seen, like a queen's present to a queen. Alone she stands for virtue's cause, when all decry upholds her laws, when to banish her is the strife, keeps her unexiled in her life, guarding her matchless innocence from storms of boldest impudence, in spite of all the scoffs and rage and persecutions of the age, owns virtue's altar, feeds the flame, adores her much derided name, while impiously her hands they tie, loves her in her captivity. Like Perseus saves her when she stands, 
exposed to the Leviathans. So did bright lamps once live in urns, so camphor in the water burns. So Etna's flames do near go out, though snows do freeze her head without. How dares bold vice unmasked walk, and like a giant proudly stalk, when virtues so exalted seen, armed and triumphant in the queen? How dares its ulcerous face appear, when heavenly beauty is so near? But so when God was close at hand, and the bright cloud did threatening stand, in sight of Israel, on the tent, they on in their rebellion went. Oh, that I once so happy were, to find a nearer shelter there. Till then, poor dove, I wandering fly, between the deluge and the sky. Till then I mourn, but do not sing, and oft shall plunge my wearied wing. If her blessed hand vouchsafe the grace, I the ark with her to give a place, I safe from danger shall be found, when vice and folly others drowned. End of section two. Section three of Poems sixteen eighty six by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Pastoral Dialogue Dorinda, Sabian perfumes, fragrant roses bring, With all the flowers that paint the gaudy spring, Scatter them all in young Alexis's way, With all that's sweet and, like himself, that's gay. Alexis Immortal laurels and as lasting praise Crown the divine Dorinda's matchless lays. May all hearts stoop, where mine would gladly yield, Had not like chorus prepossessed the field. Dorinda Would my Alexis meet my noble flame, In all Asonia neither youth nor dame, Should so renowned in deathless numbers shine, as thy exalted name should do in mine. Alexis, he'll need no trophy, nor ambitious hearse, who shall be honoured by Dorinda's verse. But where it is inscribed that here doth lie, Lycoris's love, that fame can never die. Dorinda, on Tiber's bank, I Thrices did espy, And by his side did bright Lycoris lie. She crowned his head, And kissed his amorous brow. Ah, poor Alexis, Ah, then, where wert thou? Alexis, When thou sawst that, I near had seen my fair, And what passed then Ought not to be my care. I lived not then, but first began to be, when I Lycoris loved, and she loved me. Dorinda Ah, choose a faith, a faith that's like thine own, a virgin love, a love that's newly blown. Tis not enough, a maiden's heart is chaste, it must be single, and not once misplaced. Alexis Thus do our priests of heavenly pastors tell, Eternal groves, all earthly that excel, And think to wean us from our loves below, By dazzling objects which we cannot know. End of section three. Section four of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Death Tell me thou, safest end of all our woe, Why wretched mortals do avoid thee so? Thou gentle dryer, o' the inflicted's tears, Thou noble ender of the coward's fears, Thou sweet repose to lover's sad despair, Thou calm ambition's rough tempestuous care. 
if in regard of bliss thou wert a curse, and then the joys of paradise art worse. Yet after man from his first station fell, and God from Eden Adam did expel, thou wert no more an evil but relief, the balm and cure to every human grief. Through thee, what man had forfeited before, he now enjoys, and ne'er can lose it more. No subtile serpents in the grave betray, worms on the body there, not soul, do pray. No vice there tempts, no terrors there affright, no cousining sin affords a false delight, no vain contentions do that peace annoy, no fierce alarms break the lasting joy. Ah, since from thee so many blessings flow, such real good as life can never know, come when thou wilt in thy affrighteningest dress, thy shape shall never make thy welcome less. Thou mayst to joy, but near to fear give birth, thou best as well as certainest thing on earth. Fly thee, may travellers then fly their rest, and hungry infants fly the proffered breast. No, those that faint and tremble at thy name, fly from their good on a mistaken fame. Thus childish fear did Israel of old, from plenty and the promised land withhold. They fancied giants, and refused to go, when Canaan did with milk and honey flow. End of section 4section 5 of poems 1686 by ann killigrew this librivox recording is in the public domain first epigram upon being contented with a little we deem them moderate but enough implore what barely will suffice and ask no more who say o jove a competency give neither in luxury or want we'd live but what is that which these enough do call, if both the Indies unto some should fall? Such wealth would yet enough but only be, and what they term not want or luxury. Among the suits, O Jove, my humbler take, a little give, I that enough will make. The Second Epigram on Belinda Wanton Belinda loudly does complain, I've changed my love of late into disdain, Calls me unconstant, cause I now adore, The chaste Marcella that loved her before. Sin or dishonour me as well may blame, That I repent, or do avoid a shame. The Third Epigram on an Atheist Posthumus boasts he does not thunder fear, and for this cause would innocent appear, that in his soul no terror does he feel at threatened vultures or Ixion's wheel, which fright the guilty, but when Fabius told what acts gainst murder lately were enrolled, gainst incest rapine straight upon the tail, his color changed and Posthumus grew pale. His impious courage had no other root, but that the villain atheist was to boot. The Fourth Epigram On Gala Now liquid streams by the fierce cold do grow, as solid as the rocks from whence they flow. Now Tiber's banks with ice united meet, and its firm stream may well be termed its street. Now votaries for the shrines like statues show, And scarce the men from images we know. Now winter's palsy seizes every age, 
and none so warm but feels the season's rage. Even the bright lilies and triumphant red, which o'er Corinna's youthful cheeks are spread, look pale and bleak and shew a purple hue, and violet stain where roses lately grew. Gala alone with wonder we behold, maintain her spring and still outbrave the cold. Her constant white does not to frost give place, nor fresh vermilion fade upon her face. Sure divine beauty in this dame does shine, not humane, one replied, yet not divine. A Farewell to Worldly Joys Farewell, ye unsubstantial joys, ye gilded nothings, gaudy toys. Too long ye have my soul misled, too long with airy diet fed. But now, my heart, ye shall no more deceive as you have heretofore. For when I hear such sirens sing, like Ithaca's forewarned king, with prudent resolution I will sow my will and fancy tie that's stronger to the mast not he than i to reason bound will be and though your witchcrafts strike my ear unhurt like him your charms i'll hear end of section 5this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE COMPLAINT OF A LOVER Seest thou yonder craggy rock, Whose head o'erlooks the swelling main, Where never shepherd fed his flock, Or careful peasant sowed his grain? No wholesome herb grows on the same, Or bird of day will on it rest, Tis barren as the hopeless flame, that scorches my tormented breast. Deep underneath a cave does lie, The entrance hid with dismal yew, Where Phoebus never shewed his eye, Or cheerful day yet pierced through. In that dark melancholy cell, Retreat and solace to my woe, Love's sad despair and I do dwell, The springs from whence my griefs do flow. Treacherous love that did appear When he at first approached my heart, Dressed in a garb far from severe Or threatening aught of future smart. So innocent those charms then seemed When Rosalinda first I spied, Ah, who would them of deadly deemed? But flowers do often serpents hide. Beneath those sweets concealed lay to love the cruel foe disdain, With which, alas, she does repay My constant and deserving pain. When I in tears have spent the night, With sighs I usher in the sun, Who never saw a sadder sight In all the courses he has run. Sleep which to others ease does prove, Comes unto me, alas, in vain, for in my dreams I am in love, and in them too she does disdain. Sometimes to muse my sorrow I unto the hollow rocks repair, and loudly to the echo cry, Ah, gentle nymph, come ease my care. Thou who, times past, a lover wert, ah, pity me who now am so, and by a sense of thine own smart, alleviate my mighty woe. Come flatter then, or chide my grief, catch my last words and call me fool, or say she loves for my relief, my passion either soothe or school. End of section six. Section 7 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Love, the Soul of Poetry When first Alexis did in verse delight, His muse in low but graceful numbers walked, And now and then a little proudly stalked, But never aimed at any noble flight. The herds, the groves, the gentle purling streams, Adorned his song, and were his highest themes. But love, these thoughts, like mists, did soon disperse, Enlarged his fancy, and set free his muse, Biding him more illustrious subjects choose. The acts of gods, and godlike men, rehearse. From thence new raptures did his breast inspire, his scarce warm heart converted was to fire. The exalted poet, raised by this new flame, with vigor flies where late he crept along, and acts divine in a diviner song, commits to thee eternal trump of fame. And thus Alexis does prove love to be as the world's soul, the soul of poetry. End of section 7In tears for her Telemachus was seen, When leaving home he did attempt the ire Of raging seas to seek his absent sire. Such bitter sighs her tender breast did rend, But had she known a god did him attend, And would with glory bring him safe again, Bright thoughts would then have dispossessed her pain. Ah, noblest lady, you that her excel, In every virtue may in prudence well, Suspend your care, knowing what power befriends, Your hopes and what on virtue still attends. In bloody conflicts he will armor find, In strongest tempests he will rule the wind, he will through thousand dangers force away, and still triumphant will his charge convey. And the all-ruling power that can act thus will safe return your dear Telemachus. Alas, he was not born to live in peace, souls of his temper were not made for ease. The ignoble only lives secure from harms, The generous tempt and seek out fierce alarms. Huge labors were for Hercules designed, Jason to fetch the golden fleece engined. The Minotaur by noble Theseus died, In vain were valor if it were not tried. Should the admired and far-sought diamond lie, As in its bed unpolished to the eye, It would be slighted like a common stone, Its value would be small, its glory none. But when t'has passed the wheel and cutter's hand, Then it is meet in monarch's crowns to stand. Upon the noble object of your care, Heaven has bestowed of worth so large a share, That unastonished none can him behold, Or credit all the wonders of him told. When others at his years were turning o'er, The acts of heroes that had lived before, Their valor to excite when time should fit, He then did things were worthy to be writ, Stayed not for time his courage that outran, In actions far before in years a man. 
two French campaigns he boldly courted fame, while his face more the maid than youth became. Add then to these a soul so truly mild, though more than man, obedient as a child. And, ah, should one small isle all these confine, Virtues created through the world to shine? Heaven that forbids, and madam, so should you. Remember he but bravely does pursue his noble father's steps with your own hand. Then gird his armor on, like him he'll stand, his country's champion and worthy be of your high virtue and his memory. End of section eight. Section nine of Poems sixteen eighty six by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Saint John Baptist, painted by herself in the wilderness, with angels appearing to him, and with a lamb by him. The sun's my fire when it does shine, the holy springs my cave of wine. The rocks and woods afford me meat. This lamb and I on one dish eat. The neighboring herds my garments send. My palate the kind earth doth lend. Excess and grandeur I decline. My associates only are divine. Herodias, daughter presenting to her mother, St. John's Head in a Charger, also painted by herself. Behold, dear mother, who was late our fear, disarmed and harmless, I present you here, the tongue tied up that made all jury quake, and which so often did our greatness shake. No terror sits upon his awful brow, where fierceness reigned, their calmness triumphs now. As lovers use, he gazes on my face, with eyes that languish as they sued for grace. Wholly subdued by my victorious charms, see how his head reposes in my arms. Come, join then with me in my just transport, who thus have brought the Hermite to the court. End of section 9 Section 10 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On a picture painted by herself, representing two nymphs of Diana's, one in a posture to hunt, the other bathing. We are Diana's virgin train, descended of no mortal strain. Our bows and arrows are our goods, our palaces, the lofty woods. The hills and dales at early morn resound and echo with our horn. We chase the hind and fallow deer, the wolf and boar both dread our spear. In swiftness we outstrip the wind, an eye and thought we leave behind. We fawns and shaggy satyrs awe, to Sylvan's powers we give the law. Whatever does provoke our hate, our javelins strike as sure as fate. We bathe in springs to cleanse the soil, contracted by our eager toil, in which we shine like glittering beams or crystal in the crystal streams. Though Venus we transcend in form, no wanton flames our bosoms warm. If you ask where such whites do dwell, in what blessed clime that so excel, the poets only that can tell. End of section 10 Section 11 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Invective Against Gold Of all the poisons that the fruitful earth Ere yet brought forth, or monsters she gave birth, Not to mankind has ere so fatal been as thou accursed gold their care and sin. Methinks I thee, adventurous merchant, see, Ploughing the faithless seas in search of thee, His dearest wife and children left behind, His real wealth, while he a slave to the wind. Sometimes becalmed, the shore with longing eyes, Wishes to see, and what he wishes buys. For a rude tempest wakes him from his dream, And strands his bark by a more sad extreme. Thus hopeless wretch is his whole lifetime spent, And, though thrice wrecked, is no wiser than he went. Again I see the heavenly fair despised, A hag like hell, with gold more highly prized. Men's faith betrayed, their prince and country sold, their God denied, all for the idle gold. Unhappy wretch, who first found out the ore, what kind of vengeance rests for thee in store? If Nabat's son, that Israel led astray, meet a severe reward at the last day, some strange unheard of judgment thou wilt find, Who has thus caused to sin all humane kind. End of section 11section 12 of poems 1686 by ann killigrew this librivox recording is in the public domain the miseries of man in that so temperate soil arcadia named for fertile pasturage by poets famed stands a steep hill whose lofty jetting crown casts o'er the neighboring plains a seeming frown Close at its mossy foot an aged wood, Composed of various trees there long has stood, Whose thick united tops scorn the sun's ray, And hardly will admit the eye of day. By oblique windings through this gloomy shade Has a clear purling stream its passage made, the nymph as discontented seemed to have chose this sad recess to murmur forth her woes to this retreat urged by tormenting care the melancholy chloris did repair as a fit place to take the sad relief of sighs and tears to ease oppressing grief Near to the morning nymph she chose a seat, And these complaints did to the shades repeat. Ah, wretched, truly wretched, humane race, Your woes from what beginning shall I trace? Where end from your first feeble newborn cries, To the last tears that wet your dying eyes? Man, common foe, assailed on every hand, Finds that no ill does neuter by him stand. Inexorable death, lean poverty, Pale sickness, ever sad captivity. Can I, alas, the several parties name, Which mustered up the dreadful army frame? And sometimes in one body all unite, Sometimes again do separately fight, While sure success on either way does wait, Either a swift or else a lingering fate. But why gainst thee, O death, should I inveigh, That to our quiet art the only way? 
and yet I would, could I thy dart command, cry, here, O oh, strike, and there, O oh, hold thy hand. Thee loved the happy and the youthful spare, and end the sad, the sick, the poor man's care. But whether thou, or blind, or cruel art, whether tis chance or malice guides thy dart, thou from the parents arms dost pull away, the hopeful child their ages only stay. Thee too, whom friendship in dear bands has tied, thou dost with a remorseless hand divide. Friendship, the cement that does faster twine, two souls than that which soul and body join. Thousands have been, who their own blood did spill, but never any yet his friend did kill. Then, gainst thy dart, what armour can be found, who, where thou dost not strike, dost deepest wound? Thy pity than thy wrath's more bitter far, most cruel where twould seem the most to spare. Yet thou of many evils are but one, though thou by much too many art alone. What shall I say of poverty, whence flows? Too miserable man so many woes? Ridiculous evil, which too oft we prove, does laughter cause, where it should pity move. Solitary ill, into which no eye, though near so curious, ever cares to pry. And were there among such plenty only one, poor man he certainly would live alone. Yet poverty does leave the man entire, but sickness nearer mischiefs does conspire, invades the body with a loathed embrace, prides both its strength and beauty to deface. Nor does its malice in these bounds restrain, but shakes the throne of sacred wit, the brain, and with a near enough detested force, reason disturbs and turns out of its course. Again, when nature some rare peace has made, on which her utmost skill she seems to have laid, polished, adorned the work with moving grace, and in the beauteous frame a soul doth place, so perfectly composed it makes divine, each motion word and look from thence does shine. This goodly composition, the delight of every heart, and joy of every sight. Its peevish malice has the power to spoil, and with a sullied hand its lustre soil. The grief were endless that should all bewail, against whose sweet repose thou dost prevail. Some freeze with agues, some with fevers burn, whose lives thou half out of their holds dost turn, and of whose sufferings it may be said, they living feel the very state of the dead. Thou in a thousand several forms art dressed, and in them all dost wretched man infest. And yet as if these evils were too few, men, their own kind, with hostile aims pursue. Not heaven's fierce wrath, nor yet the hate of hell, not any plague that ere the world befell, not inundations, famines, fires, blind rage, did ever mortals equally engage, as man does man, more skilful to annoy, both mischievous and witty to destroy. The bloody wolf, the wolf does not pursue, the boar, though fierce, his tusk will not improve, 
in his own kind, Bears not on bears do prey, Then art thou, man, more savage far than they. And now, methinks, I present do behold, The bloody fields that are in fame enrolled. I see, I see, thousands in battle slain, The dead in dying cover all the plain. Confused noises here, each way sent out, The vanquished's cries joined with the victor's shout. Their sighs and groans, who draw a painful breath, and feel the pangs of slow approaching death. Yet happier these, far happier are the dead, than who into captivity are led, what by their chains and by the victor's pride, we pity these and envy those that died. And who can say, when thousands are betrayed, to widowhood, or fence, or childless maid. Whither the day does draw more tears or blood, a greater crystal, or a crimson flood. The faithful wife, who late her lord did arm, and hoped to shield by holy vows from harm, followed his parting steps with love and care, sent after weeping eyes while e afar rod heated on borne by a brave disdain may now go seek him lying mong the slain low on the earth shall find his lofty crest and those refulgent arms which late his breast did guard by rough encounters broke and tore his face and hair with brains all clotted o'er, and warlike weeds besmeared with dust and gore. And will the suffering world never bestow upon the cursed causers of such woe a vengeance that may parallel their loss, fix public thieves and robbers on the cross? such as call ruin conquest in their pride, and having plagued mankind in triumph ride, like that renounced murderer who stains in these our days Alsatia's fertile plains, only to fill the future tromp of fame, though greater crimes than glory it proclaim. Alcides, scourge of thieves, return to earth, which uncontrolled gives such monsters birth. On sceptred Caucus, let thy power be shown. Pull him not from his den, but from his throne. Clouds of black thoughts, her further speech here broke. Her swelling grief, too great was to be spoke which struggled long in her tormented mind, till it some vent by sighs and tears did find. And when her sorrow something was subdued, she thus again her sad complaint renewed. Most wretched man were the ills I named before, all which I could in thy sad state deplore. Did things without alone gainst thee prevail? My tongue I chide that them I did bewail. But shame to reason, thou art seen to be Unto thyself the fatalest enemy. Within thy breast the greatest plagues to bear, First them to breed, and then to cherish there. Unmanaged passions, which the reins have broke, of reason, and refuse to bear its yoke. But hurry thee, uncurbed from place to place, a wild unruly and an uncouth chase. Now cursed gold does lead the man astray, false flattering honours do anon betray. Then beauty does as dangerously delude, 
beauty that vanishes while 'tis pursued, That, while we do behold it, fades away, And even a long encomium will not stay. Each one of these can the whole man employ, Nor knows he anger, sorrow, fear, or joy. But what to these relate, no thought does start, a side but tends to its appointed part. No respite to himself from cares he gives, But on the rack of expectation lives. If crossed, the torment cannot be expressed, Which boils within his agitated breast. Music is harsh, all mirth is an offence, The choicest meats cannot delight his sense. Hard as the earth, he feels his downy bed, His pillow stuffed with thorns that bears his head. He rolls from side to side, in vain seeks rest, For if sleep comes, at last to thee distressed. His troubles then cease not to vex him too, But dreams present what he does waking do. On the other side, if he obtains the prey, And fate to his impetuous suit gives way, Be he or rich or amorous or great, He'll find this riddle still of a defeat, That only care for bliss he home has brought, Or else contempt of what he so much sought. So that on each event, if we reflect, the joys and sufferings of both sides collect. We cannot say where lies the greatest pain, in the fond pursuit, loss, or empty gain. And can it be, Lord of the sea and earth, offspring of heaven that to thy state and birth, things so incompatible should be joined, passions should thee confound to heavens assigned? Passions that do the soul unguarded lay, And to the strokes of fortune ope away. Wert not that these thy force did from thee take, How bold, how brave, resistance wouldst thou make? Defy the strength and malice of thy foes, Unmoved stand the world's united blows? For what is't man unto thy better part? That thou, or sick, or poor, or captive art, Since no material stroke the soul can feel, The smart of fire, or yet the edge of steel, As little can it worldly joys partake, Though it the body does its agent make, And jointly with it servile labor bear, For things, alas, in which it cannot share. Survey the land, and see by heavens embraced, Thou'lt find no sweet the mortal soul can taste. Why dost thou then, O man, thyself torment, Good here to gain, or evils to prevent, Who only miserable or happy art, As thou neglects, or wisely act'st thy part? For shame then rouse thyself as from a sleep, The long-neglected reins let reason keep, The chariot mount, and use both lash and bit, Nobly resolve, and thou wilt firmly sit, Fierce anger, boggling fear, pride prancing still, Bounds hating hope, desire which naught can fill, Are stubborn all, but thou mayst give them law, they're hard-mouthed horses, but they well can draw. Lash on, and thee well-governed chariot drive, Till thou a victor at the goal arrive, Where thee free soul does all her burden leave, And joys commensurate to herself receive. End of section 12
of Poems, 1686, by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Upon the saying that my verses were made by another. Next heaven my vows to thee, O sacred muse, I offered up, nor didst thou them refuse. O queen of verse, said I, if thou'lt inspire, and warm my soul with thy poetic fire, no love of gold shall share with thee my heart, or yet ambition in my breast have part. More rich, more noble, I will ever hold the muse's laurel than a crown of gold. An undivided sacrifice I'll lay upon thine altar, soul and body pay. Thou shalt my pleasure, my employment be, my all I'll make, a holocaust to thee. The deity that ever does attend, prayers so sincere, to mine did condescend. I writ, and thee judicious praised my pen. Could any doubt ensuing glory then? What pleasing raptures filled my ravished sense! How strong, how sweet, fame was thy influence! And thine false hope, that to my flattered sight, Didst glories represent so near and bright! By thee deceived, methought each verdant tree, Apollo's transformed Daphne seemed to be, And every fresher branch, and every bough, appeared as garlands to impale my brow. The learned in love, say, thus the winged boy, does first approach, dressed up in welcome joy. At first he too the cheated lover's sight, not represents, but rapture and delight. Alluring hopes, soft fears which stronger bind, their hearts than when they more assurance find. Emboldened thus, to fame I did commit, by some few hands, my most unlucky wit. But, ah, the sad effects that from it came! What ought to have brought me honour brought me shame. Like Aesop's painted jay I seemed to all, adorned in plumes I not my own could call. Rifled like her, each one my feathers tore, and, as they thought, unto the owner bore. My laurels thus, and others' brow adorned. My numbers they admired, but me they scorned. And others' brow, that had so rich a store, Of sacred wreaths that circled it before. Where mine quite lost, like a small stream that ran, Into a vast and boundless ocean, Was swallowed up, with what it joined and drowned, and that abyss yet no accession found. Orinda Albion's and her sex's grace owed not her glory to a beauteous face. It was her radiant soul that shone within, which struck a lustre through her outward skin, that did her lips and cheeks with roses dye, advanced her height and sparkled in her eye. Nor did her sex at all obstruct her fame, but higher among the stars it fixed her name. What she did write, not only all allowed, but every laurel to her laurel bowed. The envious age, only to me alone, will not allow what I do write my own. But let him rage, and gainst a maid conspire, so deathless numbers from my tuneful lyre do ever flow, so Phoebus I by thee, divinely inspired and possessed may be. I willingly accept Cassandra's fate to speak the truth, although believed too late. End of section 13《Section 14 of Poems, 1686, by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Birthday of Queen Catherine 
while yet it was the empire of the night, and stars still checkered darkness with their light. From temples round the cheerful bells did ring, but with the peals a churlish storm did sing. I slumbered, and the heavens like things did show, like things which I had seen and heard below. Playing on harps, angels did singing fly, but through a cloudy and a troubled sky. Some fixed a throne, and royal robes displayed, and then a massy cross upon it laid. I wept, and earnestly implored to know why royal ensigns were disposed so. An angel said, the emblem thou hast seen, denotes the birthday of a saint and queen. Ah, glorious minister, I then replied, goodness and bliss together do reside. In heaven and thee, why then on earth below? These two combined so rarely do we know. He said heaven so decrees, and such a sable morn, was that in which thee, son of God, was born. Then, mortal, wipe thine eyes, and cease to rave. God darkened heaven, when he the world did save. End of section 14to my lord Colrain, in answer to his complimental verses sent me under the name of Cleonor. Long my dull muse in heavy slumbers lay, indulging sloth, and to soft ease gave way. Her fill of rest, resolving to enjoy, or fancying little worthy her employ, when noble Cleonor's obliging strains, her the neglected lyre to tune constrains. Confused at first, she raised her drowsy head, pondered a while, then pleased forsook her bed, surveyed each line with fancy richly fraught, Reread and then revolved them in her thought. And can it be, she said, and can it be, That among the great ones I a poet see? The great ones who their ill-spent time divide, Twixt dangerous politics and formal pride, Destructive vice, expensive vanity, In worse ways yet, if worse there any be. Leave to inferiors the despised arts, Let their retainers be the men of parts. But here with wonder and with joy I find, I the noble born, a no less noble mind, One who on ancestors does not rely, For fame in merit, as in title high. The severe goddess thus approved the lays, yet too much pleased, alas, with her own praise. But to vain pride, my muse, cease to give place. Virgil's immortal numbers once did grace, a smothered gnat, by high applause is shown, if undeserved, the praiser's worth alone. Nor that you should believed is't always meant, tis often for instruction only sent, to praise men to amendment and display by its perfection where their weakness lay. This use of these applauding numbers make them for example, not encomium take. End of section 15. Section 16 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Discontent Here take no care, take here no care, my muse, nor aught of art or labor use, but let thy lines, rude and unpolished, go, nor equal be their feet, nor numerous let them flow. The ruggedur my measures run when read, 
They'll livelier paint than equal paths fond mortals tread. Who, when they're tempted by the smooth ascents, Which flattering hope presents, Briskly they climb, and great things undertake, But fatal voyages, alas, they make. For 'tis not long before their feet In extricable mazes meet, Perplexing doubts obstruct their way, Mountains withstand them of dismay, Or to the brink of black despair them lead, Where's not their ruin to impede? In vain for aid they then to reason call, Their series dazzle and their heads turn round, The sight does all their powers confound, And headlong down the horrid precipice they fall, where storms of sighs forever blow, where rapid streams of tears do flow, which drown them in a briny flood. My muse pronounce aloud, there's nothing good, not that the world can show, not that it can bestow. Not boundless heaps of its admired clay, ah, too successful to betray. When spread in our frail virtue's way, for few do run with so resolved a pace, that for the golden apple will not loose the race. And yet not all the gold the vein would spend, or greedy avarice would wish to save, which on the earth refulgent beams doth send, or in the sea has found a grave, joined in one mass, can bribe sufficient be, the body from a stern disease to free, or purchase for the mind's relief, one moment's sweet repose when restless made by grief. But what may laughter more than pity move, when some the price of what they dearest love, are masters of, and hold it in their hand, to part with it their hearts they can't command but chose to miss what mist does them torment, and that to hug affords them no content. Wise fools to do them right, we these must hold, who love to pose and homage pay to gold. Nor yet if rightly understood does grandeur carry more of good, to be o the number of the great enrolled, a sceptre or a mighty realm to hold. For what is this, if I not judge amiss, but all the afflicted of a land to take, and of one single family to make? The wronged, the poor, the oppressed, the sad, the ruined, malcontent, and mad, which a great part of every empire frame, and interest in the common father claim. Again, what is't but always to abide, A gazing crowd, upon a stage to spend, A life that's vain, or evil without end, And which is yet nor safely held, nor laid aside? And then if lesser titles carry less of care, Yet none but fools ambitious are to share. Such a mock good, of which tis said tis best, when of the least of it men are possessed. But, O oh, the laurelled fool that dotes on fame, Whose hopes applause, whose fears to want a name, Who can accept for pay of what he does what others say, Exposes now to hostile arms his breast, To toilsome study, then betrays his rest. Now to his soul denies a just content, Then forces on it what it does resent. And all for praise of fools, for such are those, Which most of the admiring crowd compose. O famished soul, which such thin food can feed, O wretched labour, crowned with such a mead, Too loud, O fame, Thy trumpet is too shrill To lull a mind to rest Or calm a stormy breast 
Which asks a music soft and still. T'was not Amalek's vanquished cry, Nor Israel's shout of victory, That could in Saul the rising passion lay. T'was these soft strains of David's lyre The evil spirit chased away. But friendship fain would yet itself defend, And mighty things it does pretend. To be of this sad journey life the bait, The sweet refection of our toilsome state. But though true friendship a rich cordial be, Alas, by most tis so allayed, It's good so mixed with ill we see, That dross for gold is often paid. And for one grain of friendship that is found, Falsehood and interest do the mass compound or coldness worse than steel, the loyal heart doth wound. Love in no two was ever yet the same, no happy two, ere felt an equal flame. Is there that earth by humane foot near pressed, that air which never yet by humane breast, respired did life supply, oh, thither let me fly, where from the world at such a distance set all that's past present and to come i may forget the lover's sighs and the afflicted's tears what ear may wound my eyes or ears the grating noise of private jars the horrid sound of public wars of babbling fame the idle stories the short-lived triumphs noisy glories the curious nets the subtile weave, The word, the look, that may deceive. No mundane care shall more affect my breast, My profound peace shake or molest. But stupor, like to death, my senses bind, That so I may anticipate that rest, Which only in my grave I hope to find. End of section 16. Section 17 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Pastoral Dialogue Amentor Stay, gentle nymph, nor so solicitous be, to fly his sight that still would gaze on thee? With other swains I see thee oft converse, Content to speak and hear what they rehearse. But I, unhappy, when I ear draw nigh, Thou straight dost leave both place and company. If this thy flight from fear of harm doth flow, Ah, sure thou little of my heart dost know. Alinda, What wonder, swain, if thee pursued by flight, Seeks to avoid the close pursuer's sight. And if no cause I have to fly from thee, Then thou hast none, why thou dost follow me. Amentor, If to the cause thou wilt propitious prove, Take it at once, fair nymph, and know tis love. Alinda, To my just prayer ye favouring gods attend, these vows to heaven with equal zeal I send, My flocks from wolves, my heart from love defend. Amentor, the gods which did on thee such charms bestow, Near meant thou shouldst to love have proved a foe, That so divine a power thou shouldst defy. Could there a reason be, I'd ask thee why? Alinda, why does Lycoris, once so bright and gay, Pale as a lily, pine herself away. Why does Elvira, ever sad frequent, The lonely shades, why does yon monument, Which we upon our left hand do behold, Hapless Amintas, youthful limbs enfold? Say, shepherd, say, but if thou wilt not tell, Damon, Felicities, and Strephon well, Can speak the cause, whose falsehood each upbraids, and justly me from cruel love dissuades. Amentor, 
Hear me, ye gods, me and my flocks forsake, If ere like them my promised faith I break. Alinda, by others sad, experience wise I'll be. Amentor, but such thy wisdom highly injures me, And not but death can give a remedy. Ye learned in physic, what does it avail, That you by art, wherein ye never fail, Present relief, have for the mad dog's bite, The serpent's sting, the poisonous aconite, While helpless love upbraids your baffled skill, And far more certain than the rest doth kill. Alinda, fond swain, go dote upon the new-blown rose, Whose beauty with the morning did disclose, And ere day's king forsakes the enlightened earth, Withered returns from whence it took its birth. As much excuse will there thy love attend, As what thou dost on women's beauty spend. Amentor, ah, nymph, those charms which I in thee admire, Can nor before nor with thy life expire. From heaven they are, and such as near can die, But with thy soul they will ascend the sky. For though my ravished eye beholds in thee Such beauty as I can in none else see, That nature there alone is without blame, Yet did not this my faithful heart inflame. Nor when in dance thou mov'st upon the plain, Or other sports pursuest among the train Of choicest nymphs, where thy attractive grace Shews thee alone, though thousands be in place. Yet not for these do I, Alinda, love. Hear then what tis, what does my passion move. That thou still earliest at the temple art, And still the last that does from thence depart. Pan's altar is by thee the oftenest pressed, Thine still the fairest offering and the best, and all thy other actions seem to be the true result of unfeigned piety. Strict in thyself, to others just and mild, careful nor to deceive nor be beguiled, wary without the least offence to give, yet none than thee more ready to forgive. Even on thy beauty thou dost fetters lay, least unawares it any should betray, far unlike sure to many of thy sex, whose pride it is the doting world to vex, spreading their universal nets to take, who ere their artifice can captive make. But thou command'st thy sweet but modest eye, that no inviting glance from thence should fly, beholding with a generous disdain, the lighter courtships of each amorous swain. Knowing true fame, virtue alone can give, nor dost thou greedily even that receive. And what above this thy character can raise? Thirsty of merit, yet neglecting praise. While daily these perfections I descry, matchless Alinda makes me daily die. Thou absent flowers to me no odours yield, Nor find I freshness in the dewy field. Not Thyrus's voice, nor Melibea's lyre, Can my sad heart with one gay thought inspire. My thriving flock, mong shepherds vows the chief, I unconcerned behold as they my grief. This I profess, if this thou not believe, a further proof I ready am to give. Command, there's nothing I'll not undertake, And thy injunctions love will easy make, And if thou couldst incline a gentle ear Of plighted faith and hated hymen here, Thou hourly then my spotless love shouldst see, That all my study how to please should be, How to protect thee from disturbing care, and in thy griefs to bear the greatest share. 
nor should a joy my weary heart surprise, that first I read not in thy charming eyes. Alinda, If ever I to any do impart my till this present our well-guarded heart, that passion I have feared I'll surely prove, for one that does like to Amintor love. Amintor, ye gods, Alinda, shepherd no more, enough it is that I, thus long to love, have listened patient lie. Farewell, pan keep thee, swain, Amintor, and blessings thee, rare as thy virtues still accompany. End of section 17Section 18 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Pastoral Dialogue Melibius, Alcippi, Asteria, Lycaida, Alcimedon, and Amira. Melibius Welcome, fair nymphs, most welcome to this shade. Distempering heats do now the plains invade. But you may sit from sun securely here, If you an old man's company not fear. Alcippi Most reverend swain, far from us ever be The imputation of such vanity. From hill to holt wave the unwearied sot, And bless the chance that us hath hither brought. Asteria Famed Melibius for thy virtuous lays, if thou dost not disdain our female praise, We come to sue, thou wouldst to us recite, One of thy songs, which gives such high delight. To every ear, wherein thou dost dispense, Sage precepts clothed in flowing eloquence. Lycaida Fresh garlands we will make for thee each morn, Thy reverend head, to shade and to adorn. To cooling springs thy fainting flock will guide. All thou commandst to do shall be our pride. Melibius. Cease, gentle nymphs, the willing to entreat. To have your wish, each needs but take a seat. With joy I shall my ancient art revive, with which, when young, I did for glory strive. Nor for my verse will I accept a hire, Your bare attentions all I shall require. Alcippi Lo, from the plain I see draw near a pair, That I could wish in our converse might share. A mirror tis, and young Alcimedon, Lycaida, serious discourse industriously they shun, Alcippi, it being yet their luck to come this way, the fond ones too our lecture will betray, and though they only sought a private shade, perhaps they may depart more virtuous maid. I will accost them, gentle nymph and swain, good Melibius us doth entertain, with lays divine, if you'll his hearers be, take straight your seats without apology. Alcimedon, paying short thanks at fair Amira's feet, I'll lay me down, let her choose where tis meet. Alcippi, shepherd, behold, we all attentive sit. Melibius, what shall I sing, what shall my muse rehearse? Love is a theme, well suits a pastoral verse. That general error, universal ill, that darling of our weakness and our will, By which, though many fall, few hold it shame, Smile at the fault which they would seem to blame. What wonder, then, if those with mischief play, It to destruction them doth oft betray? But by experience it is daily found That love the softer sex does sorest wound in mind as well as body far more weak than men therefore to them my song shall speak 
advising well, however it succeed. But unto all, I say, of love take heed. So hazardous, because so hard to know, on whom they are, we do our hearts bestow. How they will use them, or with what regard, our faith and high esteem they will reward. For few are found that truly acted be by principles of generosity, that when they know a virgin's heart they've gained, and though by many vows and arts obtained, will think themselves obliged their faith to hold, tempted by friends, by interest, or by gold. Expect it not, most love their pastime make, lightly they like, and lightly they forsake. Their roving humour wants but a pretence, with oaths and what's most sacred to dispense. When unto such a maid has given her heart, and said, Alone my happiness thou art, in thee and in thy truth I place my rest, her sad surprise, how can it be expressed? When all on which she built her joy she finds, Vanish like clouds, dispersed before the winds. Herself, who the adored idol wants to be, A poor despised idolater to see, Regardless tears she may profusely spend, on Pitied sighs her tender breast may rend, But the false image she will ne'er erase, Though far unworthy still to hold its place. So hard it is, even wiser grown, to take The impression out which fancy once did make. Believe me, nymphs, believe my hoary hairs, Truth and experience waits on many years. Before the eldest of you light beheld, A nymph we had in beauty all excelled, Rodanthe called, in whom each grace did shine, Could make a mortal maid appear divine, And none could say where most her charms did lie, In her enchanting tongue or conquering eye, her virtue yet her beauty so outshone, As beauty did the garments she put on. Among the swains, which here their flocks then fed, Alcander with the highest held his head. The most accomplished was esteemed to be, Of comely form, well-graced activity. The muses too, like him, did none inspire, None so did stop the pipe or touch the lyre. Sweet was his voice, and eloquent his tongue, Alike admired when he spoke or sung. But these so much excelling parts the swain, With imperfections no less great did stain. For proud he was of an ungoverned will, With love familiar, but a stranger still, to faith and constancy, and did his heart, retaining none, exposed to every dart. Hapless Rodanthe, the fond rover caught, to whom for love with usual arts he sought, which she, ah, too unwary did bestow, cause true herself believed that he was so. But he, alas, more wavering than the wind, Straight broke the chain she thought so fast did bind. For he no sooner saw her heart was gained, But he as soon the victory disdained. Mad love elsewhere, as if twere like renown, Hearts to subdue, as to take in a town. But in the one, as manhood does prevail, both truth and manhood in the other fail. And now the nymph of late so gay and bright, the glory of the plains and the delight, who still in wit and mirth all pastimes led, 
Hung like a withered flower her drooping head. I need not tell the grief Rodanthe found, How all that should assuage enraged her wound, Her form, her fame, her virtue, riches, wit, Like death's sad weights upon her soul did sit, Or else like furies stood before her face, Still urging and upbraiding her disgrace in that the world could yield her no content, but what alone the false Alcander sent. T'was said through just disdain at last she broke, the disingenuous and unworthy yoke. But this I know, her passion held long time, constancy, though unhappy, is no crime. Remember when you love from that same hour, your peace you put into your lover's power. From that same hour, from him you laws receive, and as he shall ordain you joy or grieve, hope, fear, laugh, weep, reason aloof does stand, disabled both to act and to command. O oh, cruel fetters, rather wish to feel on your soft limbs the galling weight of steel, rather to bloody wounds oppose your breast, no ill by which the body can be pressed. You will so sensible a torment find, as shackles on your captivated mind. The mind from heaven its high descent did draw, and brooks uneasily any other law, than what from reason dictated shall be, reason a kind of innate deity, which only can adapt to every soul, a yoke so fit and light that the control, all liberty excels so sweet a sway, the same tis to be happy and obey, commands so wise and with rewards so dressed, that the according soul replies, I'm blessed. This teaches rightly how to love and hate, to fear and hope by measure and just weight. What tears in grief ought from our eyes to flow, what transport in felicity to show, in every passion how to steer the will, though rude the shock, to keep it steady still. O oh, happy mind, what words can speak thy bliss, when in a harmony thou mov'st like this? Your hearts, fair virgins, keep smooth as your brow, not the least amorous passion there allow. Hold not a parley with what may betray your inward freedom to a foreign sway, and while thus o'er yourselves you queens remain, unenvied o'er the world let others reign. The highest joy which from dominion flows is short of what a mind well governed knows. Whither, my muse, wouldst uncontrolled run, content in motion with the restless sun? Immortal thou, but I am mortal sire. Exhaust my strength, and hearers also tire. Alcippe. O heaven-taught bard, to ages couldst prolong, Thy soul-instructing, health-infusing song. I with unwearied appetite could hear, And wish my senses were turned all to ear. Alcimedon. Old man, thy frosty precepts well betray, thy blood is cold, and that thy head is grey, who past the pleasure love and youth can give, too spoilt in others, now dost only live. Wouldst thou indeed, if so thou couldst persuade, the fair whose charms have many lovers made, should feel compassion for no one they wound, but be to all inexorable found? Melibius. Young man, 
if my advice thou well hadst weighed, thou wouldst have found for either sex twas made, and would from women's beauty thee no less preserve than them secure from thy address. But let thy youth thy rash reproach excuse. Alcimedon, fairest Amira, let him not abuse thy gentle heart by his imprinting there his doting maxims, but I will not fear. For when gainst love he fiercest did inveigh, methoughts I saw thee turn with scorn away. Amira, Alcimedon, according to his will, does all my words and looks interpret still. But I shall learn at length how to disdain, or at the least more cunningly to feign. Alcippi, no wonder thou, Alcimedon, art rude, when with no generous quality endued, but hopest by railing words vice to defend, which fowlers made by having such a friend. Amira, thou art warned wisely beware, leap not with open eyes into the snare. The faith that's given to thee was given before, to Naeus, Amoret, and many more, the perjured did the gods to witness call, that unto each he was the only thrall. Asteria, you have made his cheeks with conscious blushes glow. Alcippi, tis the best colour a false heart can show, and well it is, with guilt some shame remains. Melibius. Hast, shepherd, hast, to cleanse away thy stains. Let not thy youth of time the goodly spring, Neglected pass, that nothing forth it bring, But noxious weeds, which cultivated might, Produce such crop as now would thee delight, And give thee after fame for virtue's fruit, Believe it not alone with age does suit. Not adorns youth like to a noble mind. In thee this union let a mirror find. The Kaida. Oh, fear her not, she'll serve him in his kind. Melibius. See how discourse upon the time does prey. Those hours past swiftest that we talk away. Declining soul forsaken hath the fields and mountains highest summits only gilds, which warns us homewards with our flocks to make. Alcippi, along with thee our thanks and praises take. Asteria, in which our hearts do all in one unite. The Kaida, our wishes too, that on thy head may light, what ere the gods as their best gifts bestow. Melibius. Kind nymphs, on you may equal blessings flow. End of section 18in the Queen's Barge, Anno 1641. The darling of a father good and wise, The virtue which a virtuous age did prize, The beauty excellent even to those were fair, Subscribed unto by such as might compare, The star that above her orb did always move, And yet the noblest did not hate, but love, and those who most upon their title stood, veiled also too, because she did more good, to whom the wronged and worthy did resort, and held their suits obtained if only brought, the highest saint in all the heaven of court. So noble was her heir, so great her mien, she seemed a friend not servant to the queen. To sin, if known, she never did give way, 
Vice could not storm her, could it not betray. When angry heaven extinguished her fair light, it seemed to say, Not's precious in my sight, as I in waves this paragon have drowned, the nation next, and king I will confound. End of section 19. Section 20 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On a young lady whose lord was traveling. No sooner I pronounced Celinda's name, but troops of winged powers did chant the same. Not those the poets, bows and arrows lend, but such as on the altar do attend. Celinda named flowers spring up from the ground, excited merely with the charming sound. Celinda, the court's glory and its fear, thee gazed at wonder where she does appear. Celinda, great in birth, greater in mien, yet none so humble as this fair one's seen. Her youth and beauty justly might disdain, but the least pride her glories ne'er did stain. Celinda, of each state the ambitious strife, at once a noble virgin and a wife, who, while her gallant lord in foreign parts, adorns his youth with all accomplished arts, grows ripe at home in virtue more than years, and in each grace a miracle appears. When other of her age a madding go, to the park and plays and every public show, Proud from their parents' bondage they have broke. Though justly freed, she still does wear the yoke, Preferring more her mother's friend to be Than idol of the town's loose gallantry. On her she too the temple does attend, Where they their blessed hours both save and spend. They smile, they joy, together they do pray, You'd think two bodies did one soul obey. Like angels thus, they do reflect their bliss, And their bright virtues each the other kiss. Return, young lord, while thou abroad dost roam The world to see, thou losest heaven at home. End of section 20《セクション21of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。On the Duchess of Grafton, under the name of Alinda, a song。The ambitious eye that seeks alone, where beauty's wonders most are shown, of all that bounteous heaven displays, let him on bright Alinda gaze, and in her high example see, all can admired or wished for be. An unmatched form, mind like endowed, estate and title, great and proud, a charge heaven dares to few commit, so few like her can manage it, without all blame or envy bear, the being witty, great and fair. So well these murdering weapons wield, at first herself with them to shield, then slaughter none in proud disport, Destroy those she invites to court. Great are her charms, but virtues more. She wounds no hearts, though all adore. Tis amorous beauty love invites, A passion like itself excites. The paragon, though all admire, Kindles in none a fond desire. No more than those the king's renown And state applaud affect his crown. End of section 21. Section 22 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Penelope to Ulysses Return, my dearest Lord, at length return. Let me no longer your sad absence mourn. Ilium and dust does no more work afford, No more employment for your wit or sword. Why did not thee foreseeing gods destroy, Hell in the fire brand both of Greece and Troy, Ere yet the fatal youth her face had seen, Ere loved and borne away the wanton queen, Then had been stopped the mighty flood of woe, Which now both Greece and Phrygia overflow. Then I these many tears should not have shed, Nor thou the source of them to war been led. I should not then have trembled at the fame Of Hector's warlike and victorious name. Why did I wish the noble Hector slain? Why Ilium ruined? Rise, O oh, rise again! Again, great city, flourish from thine urn, For though thou'rt burned, my lord does not return. Sometimes I think, but O oh, most cruel thought, That for thy absence thou'rt thyself in fault, That thou art captived by some captive dame, Who, when thou firedst Troy, did thee inflame. And now with her thou leadst thy amorous life, Forgetful and despising of thy wife. End of section 22section 23 of poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Epitaph on Herself When I am dead, few friends attend my hearse, And for a monument I leave my verse. An Ode Arise, my dove, from midst of pots arise, Thy sullied habitation leave, To dust no longer cleave, Unworthy they of heaven, that will not view the skies. Thy native beauty reassume, Prune each neglected plume, Till more than silver white, Than burnished gold more bright, Thus ever ready stand To take thy eternal flight. The bird to whom the spacious air was given, As in a smooth and trackless path to go, a walk which does no limits know, Pervious alone to her and heaven, Should she her airy race forget, On earth affect to walk and sit, Should she so high a privilege neglect, As still on earth to walk and sit affect, What could she of wrong complain, Who thus her birdly kind doth stain? If all her feathers molted were, And naked she were left and bare, The jest and scorn of earth and air. The bird of paradise, the soul. End of section 23. Section 24 of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Extemporary counsel given to a young gallant in a frolic. As you are young, if you'll be also wise, Danger with honor court, quarrels despise. Believe you then are truly brave and bold, To beauty when no slave, and less to gold. When virtue you dare own, not think it odd, Or ungenteel to say, I fear a god. End of section 24 End of Poems 1686 by Anne Killigrew